So this is the story of how I bought an old car and drove it from Denmark to China with a couple of friends. And how we went through amazing places such as this burning hole, were robbed by the police and otherwise just met a ton of incredible kind and awesome people. This video is proudly sponsored by nobody. I haven't really been comfortable taking any sponsorships yet, so if you want to support the channel, check out SpaghettiRoad.com for a cool t-shirt, or well, just subscribe, comment and like, it all helps out. So me and my friends, Morten and Ty, wanted to travel and decided on going to China. The easy way would be to just buy a ticket, step into a plane and get there in a few hours. But where'd the fun be in that? So instead we decided to buy a car and go overland. Traveling by car you have a lot more freedom to go anywhere you want and it seemed likely that there might be a cool place or two between Denmark and China. Before we could actually go, the first step was getting the car. We each brought about 400 US dollars to the table, so in total we had a budget of around 1200 for the car. It's sort of limited how much car you can get for that amount, so most cars we found were not exactly in the best condition. None of us really knew much about cars, but we had a naive belief that if it broke down we could just fix it ourselves by following online tutorials or something. Because cars were probably simple on the inside, right? Through the magic of the internet we found Abdul on a website with used cars. He was a man of a few words, but a very nice man, who would sell us his old Peugeot 306. Of course, it wasn't new, had racked up a lot of miles, not all the doors could open, but it looked great. We even got a carpet and a bee custom in the trunk with the car for free. Next step was planning the route. One option was, more or less, just to go straight through Russia. Though Russia is certainly an interesting place, we opted for going through a few more countries in order to see a variety of cultures. We thought we'd combine the trip with a kind of physics competition, which was being held in Bucharest in Romania. So we had one stop planned. Our idea was something like this. Go down through the south of Germany, through Austria, the Balkans, attend the physics cup in Romania, continue through Turkey, the countries in the Caucasus, Iran, the so-called Stan countries before arriving in China, and then back through Russia. The only problem with this plan was, we'd only have a short time in every place. But a small taste is better than no taste at all, we thought. Well, the next step was getting our papers in order. Sure, within Europe we could go pretty much anywhere without a visa, but once outside we'd need to arrange visas for Azerbaijan, Iran, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, China and of course Russia as well. But hey, Kyrgyzstan was cool and didn't require us to get a visa. These visas varied in difficulty from just filling out a few forms and getting it right away to reapplying and reapplying for the Turkmen visa for months. It also didn't help that most of these countries didn't have an embassy in Denmark. So we had to ship our passports to London and Berlin. Well, with a bit of luck we were all able to get a second valid passport so we could send out our passports and simultaneously apply for the visas. But still, the visa process was a bureaucratic nightmare. Also, it turns out you need a so-called carnet de passage to get the car into Iran. Sort of a tax document saying that you'll not just leave the car behind. This stupid document would cost a couple of thousand of dollars to get in Denmark, more than the car itself was worth. Well, on one of the last pages on Google we found a post by an Iranian guy, Hussein, who claimed he could temporarily import the car for us and hopefully even sort of legally. He would do the paperwork for a fraction of the price, though it was still half the value of the car. We emailed him and he told us to send him 600 euros to some random guy in the Netherlands since sanctions made it impossible to do a bank wire directly to Iran. Since people online are of course always trustworthy, we sent him the money immediately and he told us to meet him on the Armenian-Iranian border on a specific day at 9 o'clock in the morning a few months later. To be honest, we were pretty nervous that we had been swindled and would be stuck on our way into Iran. In the end, we had prepared a few visas, but not much else when we got impatient and just wanted to get going. So we planned on getting rest as we went along. We began our journey in the beginning of May and drove south from Copenhagen. It felt amazing finally being on the open road. We drove on board the ferry between Denmark and Germany. After less than an hour on the water, we arrived in Germany. The country of 80 million famously hardworking Germans, with no sense of humor, the aggressive sounding language, world known quality engineering and sauerkraut. Apart from buying some cheap beers as soon as we crossed the border, we headed straight for Berlin. A kind friend, this guy, agreed to host us and let us sleep on his floor. Of course, when visiting Berlin, you have to do some sightseeing and go to some of the must-sees, like the city's iconic Brandenburg Gate, seen here, or the Victory Column, which indeed is sort of tall, eat some German food, such as the Döner Kebab, and experience Berlin's unique nightlife and attend some hipster parties in abandoned warehouses or on the roof of old factories. This one was a particular great party, you could eat as much popcorn as you liked. At the end of the night, you can easily and conveniently go back on the U-Bahn. 
The next morning, after an amazing first day in Berlin, all the work on visas began. We filled out some forms, where the only problem was that my computer was slowly beginning to fall apart. We hoped to apply for five visas in Berlin. First goal was to pick up our passport at the Uzbek embassy, where they luckily had our Uzbek visas ready. First success. The embassy of Kazakhstan was closed for the day, for some reason. Next up, we went to the Turkmen embassy, where we filled out an application for a transit visa, since the normal one was very expensive even though our chances to get it was very slim. The Azerbaijani visa was done online. At the Russian embassy they told us that we could only apply for a Russian visa in person in Denmark. That didn't fit too nicely with our plans. Since we couldn't go back or to Russia without a visa, we decided to just drop Russia and find another way home from China. Anyway, Russia is not too big a country, right? After a very limited amount of success with getting visas in Berlin, we decided we had earned a nice break in a park. Ty is by the way quite good at balancing stuff for some reason. On the day we left Berlin, our plan was to go south through Germany as fast as possible. And I cannot say for sure how it happened since I was sleeping in the back seat, but when I woke up we went on our way to Poland. At some point we had made a wrong turn, but it wasn't too bad. Poland? It's a great country. Home of the Poles, with their pierogi, famous bison vodka and Lewandowski. An incredible country, and you're always lucky when you find it. Sometimes Poland is here, sometimes it's here, sometimes it's not on the map at all, sometimes it's here, and on this particular day, it was here. We stopped at a gas station in Poland and had a quick game of frisbee, which we were not too skilled at. We bought a map and taped it to the most convenient place, the roof of the car. I have been to Poland a few times before and after, and I really do love the country, so I truly want to say something nice about it. But on this particular trip, all we saw was a lot of Polish forests, a Polish supermarket, and some more Polish forests, where we decided to stay for the night in our tents. We woke up freezing at around 4 o'clock in the morning, since it's still quite cold in the beginning of May, and we didn't bring proper sleeping bags. We packed up and began driving at the moment we woke up to get warm again. Our next goal was Budapest. On the way there, we first went through the worry corner of the most Czech of all republics. The Czech Republic. Once we entered the country, we were told by the police we needed a vignette for driving on their roads. So we made a small donation to the Czech people in the shape of our first find for the trip. And we were out again. The next was Slovakia. The world's largest car manufacturer per capita. Again, I'll remain from reviewing the country since most of what we saw was a Slovak forest, a Slovak supermarket and some more Slovak forest before arriving in Hungary. Home of the Magyars, the land of paprika and goulash, the birthplace of everybody's favorite 20th century mathematician, Paul Erdos. We stopped and enjoyed a quick break at a beautiful parking lot in Hungary. We had some quick snacks, reorganized our stuff, brushed our teeth and continued freshly to Budapest. Budapest is a really magnificent city, with a unique atmosphere. It's hip, it's cool, it's historical. We walked around the city, went through some street festival that was being held, saw the train station and looked down on people who didn't have a car like us. Just to be clear, this, this is a joke, you're not a better person for driving a car. Saw the Hungarian parliament building across the river as it started lightening up in the night. Even the water fountains are lit with colors in Budapest. By the way, it was Morten's birthday, so we arranged a small surprise party for him in the lift of our hotel. After walking around, we found a place where we could try some of the local cuisine. After Budapest, we drove south and crossed the border to Serbia. Another incredible country. I know I've been in a bit of trouble with Serbia on this channel after the flag video, but honestly, I truly like the country. We drove to Belgrade, which some could claim is a boring city, but also did Belias then, if they said so, because it's really amazing. Before going into the actual city, of course we spent some time going around these tunnels we found. I'm not really sure about the tunnel's real purpose, but if you know, please let me know. In Belgrade they have a lot of bars and clubs built on rafts on the river, which is quite cool. During our visit we were lucky to run into some sort of festival, with light shows on the buildings celebrating Nikola Tesla. Who was Serbian by the way, they even put him on their money. We only spent one night in Belgrade, but it was wonderful. These guys played some great music. Morten was easy to travel with. He only insisted on a single destination on the road trip, Plivice National Park in Croatia, which should be beautiful according to Google. So we decided to take a detour west and go after Belgrade. The fastest route would take us through the corner of Croatia, which was nice. It could almost be compared to the corner of the Czech Republic in terms of shortcut quality. A certain 10 out of 10. Next we arrived in Bosnia and Herzegovina. It's a somewhat split country, but it's made up of incredible parts. The country even has three presidents at once instead of just one. 
Oh, and the Minister of Foreign Affairs is subscribed to this channel. So I should probably say nice things about them. Anyway, Bosnia and Herzegovina is divided into two entities. And with a name like that you'd think there's Bosnia and Herzegovina. Though these regions more or less exist, the country is divided into the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina and the Republic of Srpska. Yes, why not put five consonants in a row? From a traveler's perspective it can feel slightly like different countries. We decided to go to Banja Luka first, the capital of Srpska, and stay for the night. It's a rather cozy place with more to see than we unfortunately had time to. If you ever find yourself there, be sure to go and check out the medieval fortress, which you can climb and explore. Afterwards we went back on the road, on our way to the national park in Croatia. By the way, I have to apologize for the terrible quality of the footage. It's shot with my old phone before I did YouTube, and I didn't plan on making a video at the time. As the trip progressed, I also filmed less and less, which I really now regret. I'm sorry about that. When driving through these areas, you could still clearly see the scars from the painful past of the Balkans, in terms of explosion craters and abandoned buildings. Which nature is wasting no time reclaiming. On the way we stopped and found this beautiful Bosnian mosque. The park we were going to was just over on the Croatian side of the border, about 10 kilometers away. I was driving the car over the top of a big hill when I noticed the clutch didn't work at all. We couldn't speed up or do anything other than just slowly roll down until we had no more speed and ended up in front of this guy's house. He didn't speak a word English but kindly offered to let us put up tents in his backyard. With some assistance and luck we found a couple of young guys who could fix our car for us and get us a new clutch for around 120 euros. After some quick work on the spot they were able to move it somehow and said they'd be back in a couple of days. After they left we began setting up camp in the garden, but realized that even if things were cheaper than we were used to, the price was way too cheap when they both had to buy the part and get paid for their labor. Stupidly by us, we never even got their names or any sort of contact details on them. Did we just give our car away? This is probably a good cliffhanger to stop this part of the story at. Thank you very much for watching. If you want to help out the channel, you can support by getting one of these cool t-shirts at spaghettiroad.com. You can also support the channel on Patreon, but really, if you just subscribe, like, or comment, that's awesome as well. All engagement helps, so the YouTube algorithm will recommend this video to other people. I promise the next section of the story will be out as soon as possible. If you wish to get in contact with me, there's always my Instagram at SpaghettiRoadOfficial. Thank you very much.